Okay, we're talking about creating creatures. What makes a successful creature from a biological standpoint? What makes a good creature when we're thinking, you know, biologically? So I'd say there are kind of two main things to kind of consider here. Uh, first off, animals in the real world don't exist in a vacuum. They exist in the ecosystem with everything else around them. And the form of those animals through the course of evolution is dictated by what we call biotic and abiotic factors. So biotic factors are other living things and how that will influence uh, how you know, a creature's niche, how it will live. So for example, you know, what it eats, is there anything that predates on it, uh, diseases and parasites, that kind of thing. And the abiotic factors are the physical environment itself. So what, you know, sort of physical limits is this animal evolved to cope with? You know, what biome is it in? Are there any kind of like chemicals or things in the environment that it can take advantage of? So essentially, you can't have a design that comes out of nothing unless you have a reason behind that in the law of your world. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so glad that you said that because, you know, when people think about successful creatures, they think about, you know, what you learned in biology and, you know, they think about, you know, creatures that feed and creatures that, you know, mate and pass on their, their genetic code. But people often forget that, you know, there are all of these, as you said, abiotic factors like what happened to the dinosaurs, for example, or on the on the flip side, things like the great bloom, where all of a sudden there was this like huge blooming in the ocean and suddenly the, you know, the whole balance of the ecosystem changed. You know, the, these are things that world builders love to do. They love to have cataclysms. They love to have these big world events. And they very often forget that that is going to have a really interesting impact on their species that they can then use to, you know, further the stories, the, the impact of the cataclysm that they've already created. I do not want to miss the chance to have an answer to this question. So what is a biological explanation for how dragons could breathe fire. I was promised this. I am here <laughs> well, for it. I this. am excited. Share with us, Shireen. What are your thoughts? Uh, so that there are a few different kind of avenues which you could go down with this. Um, so I have fire breathing creatures in some of my stories. The route that I take is similar to the bombardier beetle, that they have a flammable venom. So the way that I kind of do it is that they have like sort of two chambers with different chemicals, and then they can put the chemicals together, spit it out, perhaps using like an enzyme or a catalyst to kind of get the reaction going. And it's like a highly flammable material in the presence of oxygen. Uh, so that that would be that's that's kind of the way that I'm sort of doing it. But the way but where you don't want to go too far unless you're actually a chemist is maybe saying exactly what those materials are. In terms of the bombardier beetle, it doesn't breathe fire, but it does do something kind of similar where it kind of mixes chemicals, two different ones, puts them in a little chamber in its body. They, and then in a pres in the presence of a catalyst, they heat almost to the boiling, almost to a boiling point of water, produce a lot of gas, which then shoots it under pressure out of the, out of the beetle. Um, another way you could potentially do it would be to kind of have the dragon maybe breathe hydrogen. I'm not so keen on that one myself because you need like some other kind of ignition mechanism for it. But I think like it's a little bit less reliable. So yeah, I mean, I, I have heard people kind of like do the hydrogen one. Uh, they like it because it has the side effect that hydrogen might make them help them float a little bit as well. But that is another way you could do it, but you might have to think about the ignition mechanism. There could be ways. I mean, I like electric eels can make sparks. So that could be that could be something um, to sort of heat it. But yeah, I, I like to go for the, the flammable venom. You could also, I have like a few different fire breathers. One of the fire breathers I have is that they can only breathe fire over a certain air temperature. So if it's too cold, then it won't auto ignite, which is like limitations to powers. I, I like quite a lot because, you know, yes. you can get some nice like story elements that way. We have a whole video about the triangle of power and bringing in costs and limitations to your world building. So yes, absolutely that. I mean, animals essentially can have superpowers 
if they're in the right environment. So it also kind of, you know, when we think about fire breathing creatures, it also brings us back to where we started, which is the idea of, you know, cataclysms and how, you know, the world can change and creatures need to change with it. If your fire breathing dragon is suddenly in an oxygen richer or oxygen poorer environment, what is that going to do? We know the level of oxygen has changed in our world at some point. Mm. So what if there was a cataclysm? How would that affect you know, other creatures, but also those abilities. And I said, like, even depending on how you went down the fire breathing angle, even things like some kind of change to the climate could have like a big difference. Yeah. Or, um, you know, again, if you wanted to have like anything that was sort of temperature dependent and, you know, you've got people who are maybe wanting to be very mean and kill this dragon, they might go after it at night or after it in the winter when it's, you know, not able to breathe fire so effectively. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, these these are interesting. When do you hunt a dragon? When it's cold, when it's hibernating, because, you know, it's a lizard, so it doesn't want to be around when it's cold. That's the time that you you find it and hit it, right? That's an interesting setup. That's an interesting world building uh, setup for a story as well. Yeah, I have enjoyed this so much, Shireen. Thank you so, so very much for coming to join us today. Oh, thank you very much for inviting me on. It's been very fun.